There is a tale told amongst the caravaneers that travel through the dark lands connecting the old world to the distant kingdoms in the east. In this story, an expedition laden with silks and spices found itself lost in a labyrinth of mountain trails. Every promising way out led them only deeper into the range, until finally, in desperation, they sent out a single rider to chart a safe path through the winding crags ahead. After many days of fruitless searching, the rider found himself in a great valley, which to his astonishment was blanketed in pure white snow, despite the great warmth of the summer sun. It was only when he came closer and made to touch it with a hand that he realized it was not snow at all, but the snow-white fat drained from corpses uncounted. Everything that walked or crawled or slithered across the earth had been butchered and left a season in the sun, for the rider had stumbled across the homeland of the Ogre Kingdoms. Illiterate and blinded by their own superstitions, no records exist of how such a race came into being, beyond the heavily mythologized tales of bravado recounted by the ogres themselves. Foreign lawmasters believe the ogres might be a work unfinished, a race created by the Old Ones who departed before their ultimate designs came to fruition. Others believe they are an offshoot of the halflings, for though they vary drastically in their appearance, both share an all-consuming need to seek out their next meal, and a strange resistance to the forces of chaos. The first reliable records of the ogres can be found in the histories of Grand Cathay. Their scholars record that the ogres once tended a vast steppe of grassland beyond the mountains of Morn to the east of Cathay. Here, the ogres lived a life of plenty, raising herds of new beasts and lumbering yak for food, and maintaining peaceful relations with their human neighbors. Yet, as the population of ogres began to soar, even their great herds were not enough to stave off their ever-present hunger. The foraging parties of ogres that appeared across Cathay soon turned into raiding warbands. They consumed the harvests of their neighboring nation, carrying off cattle and children to feed upon. The Dragon Emperor would not stand for such a blight upon his people, and made ready to unleash his vengeance. Yet, a costly invasion of the ogre homeland would not be needed. Whether through the powers of the Dragon Emperor, the actions of Cathay's famed astromancers, or merely coincidental timing, a bright star that shone with jade light resolved into a terrible comet that struck at the heart of the steppe. Its shock was felt across the world as the ancestral home of the ogres was obliterated. Its seas of tall grass burned to embers, the rising smoke turning into a choking mist that no wind could dissipate. Only those tribes at the very edge of the stricken territory survived intact, and the few enfeebled survivors who managed to claw their way out from deeper in the impact zone. Before dying of their wounds, the latter ogres told of a great mouth that now sat at the heart of their land, an immense moor that had swallowed their kin and still hungered for more. The ogre tribes that escaped destruction were forced from the ruins of their lands, driven into the mysterious west by their need for new prey and their gnawing, ravenous, unnatural hunger. Of these days, even less is known, as the ogres faded, for a time, out of the Cathayan histories and into legend. Crude ogre paintings, once interpreted, tell of a great war above the clouds with a race of ancient giants, immense sky titans, that dwelt in lonely citadels at the top of the world. Here, the ogres, believing they had entered a golden paradise of plenty, a promised land of raw meat, braved the relentless cold and thinned air to batter down the walls of these fortresses and consume their titanic inhabitants. With immense bones sucked of all marrow, all that remained of the Sky Titans, the ogres slowly made the descent back down to the earth, heartened by the belief that they could and would consume anything and everything as they pleased. Beneath the bastions of the Sky Titans, the migrating ogres found the Mountains of Morn, a formidable range of deep valleys and twisting mountain paths filled with exotic beasts and bountiful prey. Here, the ogres settled, founding what would become the Ogre Kingdoms. Today, this wild land remains populated by scattered tribes of ogres living a semi-nomadic lifestyle that takes them through the high mountain passes and abyssal valleys. 
beneath the towering peaks, the ogres clash with wild beasts, the unknown horrors of the deep caves, and dreaded black orcs. But their various warbands can just as frequently be found, warring amongst themselves. There are no cities or towns within the ogre kingdoms. Each tribe dwells in a camp of animal skin yurts and makeshift shelters. These primitive settlements are without exception, raised around a roaring fire, above which a great cooking pot constantly bubbles. These tribes frequently migrate between familiar lands in the Mountains of Morn, driven by the earnest but never spoken aloud belief that if you stay still for too long, the sky will fall on you. Bands of ogres that leave their tribe to venture beyond the kingdoms are inevitably faced with the challenge of tracking down their kin when they return. The ogres themselves typically take the shape of an immense humanoid, often standing at nine feet tall and seemingly bursting in fat and muscle. Sporting heavily toothed mouths and large livers and oversized digestive tracts, ogres are capable of eating venomous, toxic, and even chaos-tainted creatures with ease. This is of vital importance to their survival, for the infamous gluttony of the ogres is nothing less than a biological necessity. Whilst many ogres hold a close, albeit oversized, resemblance to baseline humans, the ancient subspecies of yetis are known to be covered in thick white fur and exhibit an extreme resilience to the cold. These semi-evolved ogres display a feral, bestial nature compared to their more widely encountered cousins and are rarely found below the snow lines of the tallest mountains. Likewise, gorges are an offshoot of socially devolved ogres that populate the deep caves of the Mountains of Morn, and are thought to be the remains of tribes that have wandered into the deep darkness and lost their way back to the surface. Ogre society, such as it is, remains especially primitive and based around a simple philosophy of might makes right. This is enforced through a brutal pecking order headed by those who can drink the most, fight the most, but above all, eat the most. Ogre chieftains, known as tyrants, represent the apex of this philosophy, with their lieutenants, known as bruisers, enforcing their authority through intimidation and bullying. The phrase, that will cost an arm and a leg, can be quite literal in ogre camps, and is in fact the primary method of discipline. The power and prestige of a tribe is embodied in their mortooth, a stone that bears various marks and sigils. This serves as a kind of history for the tribe, and is one of the few permanent fixtures that is carried from camp to camp. It is placed in a predominant position wherever the tribe settles, typically near the tyrant's hut. To exist in this society is to expect and provoke constant challenges, with every ogre fighting to gain the position above them and hold off those below. Unlike the similar hierarchies practiced by the Greenskins and other bestial races, however, challenges within the Ogre Kingdoms can be good-natured. Typically, the winner might only demand a small part of the loser, such as a finger or ear, as a victory spoil. It is only in challenging the ruler of a tribe, the Tyrant, that the defeated might have their bloody corpse added to the victor's supper. As an ogre grows larger and fiercer, their reputation will grow too, boosted by impressive deeds and acts of gluttony. Reputation is the only measure of an ogre's worth, both in life and according to their faith, in the afterlife. This is cemented through the bestowing of a big name, a descriptive honorific, that is seen as the first step in becoming a successful tyrant. Though the term Ogre Kingdom remains something of a misnomer, for no true kings exist amongst the tribes, the various tyrants occasionally pledge allegiance to an over-tyrant. This is an especially formidable ogre who claims dominion, at least nominally, to leadership over the whole of the race. To prevent the tribes from descending too far into disorder, ogre society embraces fighting and feasting in a near-constant cycle. These two acts are closely related in an ogre's psyche, with many battle cries translating directly into the phrase, Feed Me. A feast, often held after a great victory in battle, offers the chance for the tyrant to display their prowess and gluttony to their gathered kin and heal any lingering resentments. The greater the feast that is held, the greater the reputation of the tyrant, cementing their power and offering the chance for others to gain social stature. Bretonian roasted in garlic, thick sausages stuffed with the finest empire meat, 
sautéed dwarf, and the delicacy of elf legs fried in horse blood are all staple dishes of any good feast, offered first to the tyrant before being passed down the long trestle tables to be devoured by the rest of the tribe. As part of this cycle, semi-formal sports form the third pillar of ogre society. From brutal pit fighting, to the classics of face cracking, fist splinter, belly barging, and the visceral guts out, ogres are known to love sports almost as much as food. As with all ogre challenges, the losers of such contests, if they survive at all, are forced to offer parts of themselves for consumption so that the victor may gain their strength and reputation. Any feast worthy of the title will be organized around a moor pit, a deep hole filled with broken weapons and rotting meat, where these contests are held to the bellowing cheers of onlookers. Just as its facsimile forms the heart of an ogre feast, the Great Moor sits at the center of ogre religion, for it is seen as the source of both magic and the ogre's own unending hunger. Anyone familiar with ogres even in passing will recognize the rounded, toothed sigil of the moor that adorns every ogre banner and belly plate. The Great Moor itself is a thing of mystery, a vast pit filled with straining muscles and a terrible whirlpool of razor-sharp teeth. It rests deep within the old ogre homeland, centered in the crater where the ruinous comet struck many thousands of years ago. In those dark days, it was found by Groth One Finger, who, determined to look upon the cause of his people's downfall, ventured with his tribe back into the wastes of their homeland. When he and the few survivors returned, they were changed, filled with reverence for the moor and an understanding of the catastrophe that had befallen them. Many accepted it for the tale of this immense god who could swallow so many tribes and still hunger for more appealed to the ogre's own appetites. The faith spread quickly amongst the ogres and persists to this day. Thanks to their aptitude for work as mercenaries and pirates, ogres can be found fighting in small bands in every corner of the world, often adopting the tactics and war gear of their employers. It is a rare sight for an entire army of ogres to gather, but when they do, it typically involves a tribe undertaking a migration or several tribes working under the heel of the over tyrant. When gathered en masse, they are like a mountain descending on a foe, annihilating everything in their path and leaving ruin in their wake. Every member of Ogre society is a capable warrior, making their armies an undisciplined yet formidable mix of individuals. From the common bulls with their simple clubs to the thundering lead belchers, the hardened iron guts and the veteran man eaters, the daring Mournfang and Rhinox Riders, to even crude war machines like the Scrap Launchers and Iron Blasters, the Ogres practice an uncomplicated brutality in war that suits them perfectly. A small band of Ogre mercenaries might be led by a Butcher or a Slaughtermaster, their orders enforced by ruthless bruisers, whilst larger groupings will be led by the tribe's tyrant themselves. For an Ogre, a battle is only ever as great as the feast that follows it, Taking the enemy's supplies and baggage train is only a small garnish compared to the glut of meat available from the bodies of the fallen. All of the greatest battles in Ogre legend are marked by immense feasts, such as the great plundering of Karakazorn and the feast atop the Firemouth that marked the cementing of Overtyrant Goldtooth's rule. All across the world, many people have grown accustomed, if not comfortable, to the presence of Ogres. Even the greatest cities of the Empire host whole groups of the savage race, working as mercenaries, hired muscle, and bodyguards in every industry. Yet their society is far greater than merely the small bands of adventurers that the average denizen of the old world might see. With the Ogre Kingdoms, the might of this species is slowly being gathered. Great feasts uniting every tribe, once rare and now commonplace. Under the iron rule of the over-tyrant Greasus Goldtooth, the ogres have once again soared in numbers not seen in generations. The tribe's growing ever larger as food and gold is exchanged for services with the outside world. Whilst their raids on the great caravans that pass from Cathay into the old world have begun to slow, leading some to believe that their place in the world is waning, their true strength remains hidden. For the Overtyrant knows the true purpose of his people. 
he remembers the tales of the war with the Sky Titans, the great deeds the ogres did in ages past, and he knows that the world they see now is merely a small thing, there for the taking. The ogres are no mere mercenaries, no simple beasts lurking in the wilds. They are a mouth, slowly opening to swallow the old world whole. The Templin Institute investigates the nations, factions, and organizations of alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards.